Good afternoon, congregation. And a special welcome to our many guests here this afternoon uh, in connection with this afternoon's baptism and profession of faith. We uh, were delighted to see you here, and we pray that you will also be edified by word and sacrament along with the rest of us. Uh, we have no announcements this afternoon, just a reminder of the coffee social. Uh, for those not familiar with how we do it, it's outside in the parking lot over to the side over here. We welcome our pastor, Rolfton Hollander, to our pulpit this afternoon. Good afternoon, all. It is indeed a special afternoon that we can gather for worship, profession of faith of Jackson and the baptism of little Miles. Out of reverence for the Lord, let's begin our worship together then while standing. Our call to worship this afternoon is taken from the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 7. This is part of the vision of John. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and honor and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Let's join this great multitude of which we are a part as the Catholic and undoubted the Catholic Church. Let us confess together then in response to this where our help comes from. Congregation, where does your help come from? Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. Amen. Receive also his greeting, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Let's also respond to this greeting of God by singing one of the Psalms of Ascent, Psalm 125. The Psalms of Ascent were sung by God's people as they would pilgrimage to Jerusalem and as they would worship Him there in the temple courts with the people of God. And so a fitting way for us also to begin our worship together among the people of God. 125, 1 and 2. also like to lead you in a word of prayer as we ask God for His blessing over our worship this afternoon. Our Father in heaven, 
It is a real blessing for us to be together on this special Sunday afternoon. You have blessed us already this morning with the opportunity to gather for worship. We can gather into your presence, addressing you as a father, knowing ourselves as belonging to a family of faith. And on this Father's Day, we remember that fatherhood on earth receives its name from you. We are to be as fathers a reflection of your fatherhood. It's your care for your children that has provided us with this opportunity to be here again this afternoon, that you would feed us, body and soul, with your Word, with Christ who is the bread of life and the living waters, who is the one who is the Word. Father, we're blessed by that Word because we know that all flesh is like grass. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow, it withers like the flower of the field. But Your Word, it stands forever. Your Word goes from generation to generation. That we get to open the Scriptures again this afternoon is a testimony to that again. We know this to be Your self-revelation. Words recorded already, the days of Moses, recorded over centuries, millennia even, and still passed on to our generation. Your Word stands forever. And we are humbled that we can open that Word this afternoon. You have not dealt like this with, like this with every nation. It's a testimony to Your grace and Your love. You send Your Word to whom You will and when You will and how You will. We're grateful for that grace this afternoon as You have brought us together as congregation. The congregation here in Living Light, together with family and friends and visitors, to celebrate Your goodness as You've shown that also especially to, to Jackson and Calvin and Naomi in, in Miles. We rejoice at the many blessings which You have poured out on us and pray that our time together in worship, in opening Your Word, would be a blessing to each of us, but above all would bring glory to You. May our worship be pleasing to You as we give to You our hearts and from our hearts words of praise and thanksgiving and gratitude. Hear us, not because we deserve it, but we pray it in Jesus' name alone. Amen. As we hear at Living Light have been studying the doctrine of salvation summarized in the Heidelberg Catechism of the afternoon worship services, we've come to Lord's Day 21. And since it is fitting in connection with both profession of faith and baptism, we are continuing there. I would like to read with you from two passages of Scripture, first of all from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians and then John's first letter. We'll read them in that order. That's the way they appear in the New Testament, but they will come back in the sermon in the opposite order, 1 John 3, in connection with the first point, our confession in the present, and 1 Corinthians 1 in connection with the second point, our confidence for the future. So bear that in mind also as we read. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 through 9, if you received a Bible from the ushers, that's on page 952. This is how Paul opens his letter. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes. The church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in Him in all speech and all knowledge even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 
so far the excerpt from that letter. Then we'll also turn to 1 John chapter 3. Read the verses 11 through 24, page 1022 of the Bibles provided. 1 John 3, 11 to 24. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. And this is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He has commanded us. Whoever keeps His commandments abides in God and God in Him. And by this, we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. So far, our reading from God's Holy Word. We'll also sing together from Psalm 87. It is a psalm about God's church again, how God gathers His church from all nations, and in that way, it is also a confession of God's Catholic church, Catholic Christian church. Psalm 87, we'll sing all five stanzas.
As I said earlier, we've come to Lord's Day 21 here in Living Light, Grimsby. This afternoon, I'm going to just focus on question and answer 54. Lord's Day 21 is, I would say, well known as one of those Lord's Days that almost has too much material in it. But that may be true for every one of the Lord's Days. There's just that much material in the Catechism. So this afternoon, we're going to just look at question and answer 54. I will ask the question, and I would ask that you as congregation together recite the answer. What do you believe concerning the Holy Catholic Christian Church? I believe that the Son of God, out of the whole human race, from the beginning of the world to its end, gathers, defends, and preserves for Himself by His Spirit and Word in the unity of the true faith a church chosen to everlasting life. And I believe that I am and forever shall remain a living member of it. As our all man to that, we will sing from hymn 61 both stanzas. And then I would ask that you remain standing after that and we will recite the Apostles' Creed together. I accidentally forgot to include that in the liturgy sheet, so it's not in the liturgy sheet, but we will be confessing our faith together as well with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, without further introduction, let's just zero in on the end of question and answer 54, which is the theme for this afternoon. I am and forever shall remain a living member of the church. We're going to look at that in two parts. It's a confession in the present, and it's a confidence for the future. I am and forever shall remain a living member of the church. It's first of all, our confession in the present. I am. Here, that's a comment about the present. I am a living member of the church. What church? Well, the Holy Catholic Christian Church that has just been confessed. Just like when Jackson will confess his faith before God and his church later, then he'll be asked in the fourth question, Jackson, do you firmly resolve to commit your whole life to the Lord's service as a living member of His church? We often say it's important to dot your I's and cross your T's, but don't cross a T that isn't there. It doesn't say a living member of this church, but of His church. One T makes all the difference. We're not asking Jackson to make a lifelong commitment to this church here in Grimsby, but to His church, the Lord's church. Who knows where the Lord leads Jackson? Together with Ava, perhaps. That doesn't separate this church from His church, but it's important to be clear. This church is a local manifestation. We say it's a local picture of the whole of His church. I am a living member of the Holy Catholic Christian Church. Some brief definitions to start. Holy, that is, set apart. When God calls His people a holy people, it's because He's chosen them out of all the nations of the earth to be a people belonging to Him. He set them apart. And He gave them a sign and a seal of that set-apartness. In the Old Testament, circumcision. In the New Testament, baptism. Miles is later going to receive the sign and seal of His holiness. Of His being set apart in Christ. In relationship with God. The church is holy. It's gathered, says our catechism, out of the whole human race. Out of, we might say, defines that word holy. Jesus calls the church 
the ecclesia. We use the word in English, ecclesiastical. It's a word that literally means called out. The church is called out of the world. It's separated from the world. We heard that last week with Nehemiah chapter 13, how Israel fell and how God's people in general fall when the world and the church begin to blend, when the lines become blurred. There has to be a clear separation because the church is holy. It's always good for us to remember that characteristic of the church. That there not be a hole in our holiness, we heard last week. It's also Catholic, universal. It's called out of the whole human race from the beginning of the world to its end. We just sang about the Catholicity of the church in Psalm 87. Jerusalem, Mount Zion, I said, is the church. Stanza 2, we sang together, What glorious things, O city of God's favor, are said of you, proclaimed in joyful tone. I number Egypt, even Babylon, among all those who know me as their Savior. The Cushite, the Philistine, and the Tyrian, I will now read in my register inscribe and say of every nation and every tribe, this one was born within the walls of Zion. And when John has a vision in Revelation chapter 7, which was our call to worship, he looks and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing there before the throne of God and before the, thro for, before the Lamb. What a vision that must have been. It doesn't take much to get caught up in our own little church life, in our own small community, and to forget about this Catholicity of the church. But it's splendid. It's a life-changing experience when you can travel around the world and meet brothers and sisters in Christ wherever you go. They might dress differently, they might talk differently, they might even worship differently. Yet this is our Catholic and undoubted Christian confession. I am a living member of the Catholic Church. Part of that innumerable multitude. That can snatch me out of becoming too preoccupied with my own little life to once again fill me with awe over Christ's work. He's gathering, defending, and preserving His church out of the whole human race from the beginning of the world to its end. That's the church that I confess I am a living member of. A Christian church. That is one that belongs to Christ. The body of Christ. He the head, the church, His members, they are a blood-bought people, even miles. The promise of the forgiveness of sins in Christ's blood, that's a whole different kind of bloodbath. Back to that vision of Revelation 7 verse 13, that one of the elders addresses John saying, Who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? And John says to him, ah, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's the church we're talking about. A holy, Catholic, Christian church. Jackson and Miles, who get a little bit of the spotlight this afternoon, they are both members of that church, but differently, aren't they? Miles is going to have nothing to say for us this afternoon, at least not the same way that Jackson is. Jackson is going to give his I do to our very confession this afternoon. I am a living member of the church. Not just a member of the church, but a living member. Miles is a member by covenant. He's a full-fledged member. He's on the books. 
Yet we call him a non-communicant member. It's not any less of a member. That's true for all the boys and the girls here this afternoon. You're not any less of a member than your parents. You have a baptismal certificate to prove it. But there will come a point, the Lord willing, that we could say you take full ownership of that membership. That's what Jackson is doing. What many of us have done here this afternoon already. That we don't just say, I am a member of the church, but I am a living member of it. That's a confession of faith. True faith. Belgian Confession Article 29 says that in the church there are also hypocrites. They're mixed in the church along with the good. You can't see them, but they're just acting. They're, they're putting on a show, a display. They wear a mask. I'm not talking about those masks that we had to get used to wearing the last couple of years. They might look like they belong. And no one might even find out, but they're fakes. And eventually they will be find out, found out. God can see into their hearts. God forbid that there are any here this afternoon. But it does require self-examination then, doesn't it? How else can you confess in the present, I am and forever shall remain a living member of the church? That's a personal confession. I am. I can't say that for you. You can't say that for me. Each will have to look into his own heart, her own heart. And the boys and girls here can do that too this afternoon. Jackson's desire is that by professing his faith, he can participate in the Lord's Supper. We're going to hear that in the forum later too. Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians 11 that a person has to examine himself before he gets to eat and drink of the, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I may be a member of the church, but am I a living member of the church? But what is a living member? We praise God for the gift of life displayed here again this afternoon. That's true for everyone here, of course. We're alive. But I'm thinking of little Miles. He was born alive. That's not to be taken for granted. Sadly, it happens that babies can be stillborn. Or they die already in the womb. For some here this afternoon, that ache is still so very real. Miles lives. His lungs expand, his heart beats, his brain neurons fire, and so much more, I'm sure. Calvin and Naomi have spent many an hour already just watching, marveling. He's alive. But that's not what we're talking about here, are we? when we make this confession in the present. It's far more. How can I say that I am a living member? If you have your Bibles with you, look up the proof text with me. 1 John chapter 3. It is what we read, 1 John 3, but this is the proof text for the last part of the Lord's Day there, or the question and answer. I believe that I am. Footnote 8, 1 John 3, 14. This is what it says, 1 John 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life, living member, because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to consider Miles dead or Jackson dead before he says his I do. This is about in our sinful nature, outside of Christ, we are dead. Baptism signifies and seals that to us. We're going to hear in the form. We and our children are conceived and born in sin and therefore subject to all sorts of misery, even to condemnation. We are children of wrath so that we cannot enter the kingdom of God unless we're born again. Apart from Christ, we are dead. But in Christ, we are made alive. What does that look like? 
Back to verse 14. We know that we have passed out of this death into life because we love the brothers. That's an observation about the present. Our love for our brothers and sisters, of course, is proof of that life in us. It's a life that's worked in us by the Lord and giver of life. He works that in us, we confess in Lord's Day 21, by His Word and Spirit. Christ's gathering, defending, and preserving of His church begins to look like something. This isn't just a confession about a doctrinal truth about the Holy Catholic Christian Church. It's not just a technical question and answer so that you know how to define the church. We're saying that this has a direct bearing on me. Here's a couple of other big words. One of them you might know, orthodoxy. Break it into two words, orthodoxy, right teaching. But orthodoxy has to be paired with another big word, orthopraxy. Break that into two words, right living, practice. We read it in 1 John 3, 18. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. It's not that you can't love in words. That's not his point. Maybe we could add the word just. Little children, let us not just love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And then verse 19, by this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before Him. We know we are of the truth when we love in truth. And what does that mean? What does that look like? Verse 16, by this we know love. That He laid down His life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. John defines what love is. And he doesn't go on to give us some human examples of what that might look like. He goes straight for the supreme example. By this we know love that He laid down His life for us. He doesn't even have to spell out who He is. We all know who He's talking about. We know love when we consider what Christ has done. He laid down His life for us. He didn't only walk around telling people about His love for them, though that was certainly part of His teaching. But it was more than just words and talk. He did what He said. He laid down His life. And not just His biological life, we might say, He gave His psyche in Greek. That means he gave himself wholly and completely. He died a complete and total death. He laid down everything. He gave the greatest gift. If greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends, what about when this someone is the Son of God become man, laying down his life for us while we were still his enemies? Sinners. That's who we are, aren't we? And yet Christ laid down His psyche, His psyche for us. He gave Himself wholly and completely and willingly and totally. Give, give, give. That was His love. Until there was nothing more He could give. Not just word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Yes, in truth, because He gave Himself willingly, genuinely, wholeheartedly. It was a sacrifice He made, not grudgingly, but gladly. Oh, not without wrestling about it. Remember Him in the Garden of Gethsemane, in anguish so that sweat came like drops of blood? He was sorrowful and troubled. He prayed, Father, if it be Your will, let this cup pass from me. But not because he was unwilling. No, he said immediately, not my will be done, but your will be done. It was because the weight of what he was about to do was so immense. 
he would have to endure God forsakenness for our sin, eternal punishment of body and soul, and yet he gave. He laid down his life in love for the unlovable. The unlovable who then become the beloved. That's how chapter 3 began, actually. Behold, the amazing gift of love the Father has bestowed on us, the sinful sons of men, to call us sons of God. If you want to know what loving in deed and in truth is, in other words, you have to look first at what the Son did in giving His life and why. That's love. A love we have to imitate. For verse 16 goes on to say, By this we know love, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and the sisters. It's not a helpful suggestion that John offers. Not a recommendation. It's a command. We ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. If or because this is what Christ has done, we ought to do the same. He laid down. We lay down. He gave. We gave. Little children, let us not love in word or deed or talk, but in deed and in truth. Let that love, in deed and in truth, be modeled after the love of Him who laid down His life for us, who gave everything He had, even to endure God forsakenness. That love is evidence of life. I am and forever shall remain a living member of the church. That's the confession about the present. There is this holy Catholic Christian church. But that's not just something I know and talk about and identify. I am a living part of it. My living shown in my love. Is that a proud statement? A bold confession? A claim I make about myself in a sense of accomplishment? It's not, is it, beloved? For John goes on to write more in the section that we read. He ends that section with verse 24. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. So when I confess in the present, I am a living member of the church, I'm not patting myself on the back for having arrived here. I'm identifying the work of the Spirit in me, bringing me to life in Christ, full of love like Christ then it's a confession that's full of praise. I am and forever shall remain a living member of His church. Praise be to God for His wonderful work of grace in me, not only by sending His Son to die for me, but also gathering me to Himself so that I'm alive. Truly alive in Him and a member of His church. I see it in my life. His love made manifest in my love for my brother and my sister, fellow members of the same church. And if that love is not evident, then there's a real call for repentance, isn't there, brothers and sisters? A call for change. From a broken and contrite heart. Otherwise, there can really be no confidence for the future. That's our second point, briefly. In a short while, Jackson is going to be asked another question, one that many of us have been asked this afternoon already. Do you promise, by the grace of God, steadfastly to continue in this doctrine? 
And then I typically ask the catechism students, how can you promise that? How can you promise to steadfastly continue in something when you don't know the future? Don't we all know examples, sad examples, of people who've done profession of faith and are no longer members of the church? What does the future hold? How can you say, I am and forever shall remain a living member of it? After all, just look back on the past. It's not such a straight line to this day, is it, if you will? It's not a smooth road. Back to that point of self-examination, looking inward is pretty revealing, isn't it? Unless sin has so blinded us to our own sin. David says in Psalm 25, remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. You know what he's talking about, Jackson? Sins of youth. Not just you, of course. The older you get, the harder it can get. That it's not just sins of youth, it's sins of middle age and sins of old age. There's just more and more years for sin to pile up. What if you fall into still greater sin, serious sins? Can you say, I am and forever shall remain a living member of the church? How can you be so sure? By the grace of God. You're not going to say, I do, to this question. Do you promise steadfastly to continue in this doctrine? No, you're going to answer this question. Do you promise by the grace of God steadfastly to continue in this doctrine? Then you get your confidence, not from your own commitment, your own strength, your own power of resolve. No, it comes from the grace of God. The grace that brought you here will be the grace to bring you home. It's what made Paul so angry about the false gospel that the Galatians were hearing and taking up. He asks them in Galatians 3 verse 3, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? It's not first God's part in bringing you here through His Spirit and then mine, a resolve and a commitment to stick with it, a stick to maybe you've heard that before. No, no stick to itiveness. That's not what this confessed confidence for the future rests on. It's the grace of God. I promise by the grace of God steadfastly to continue in this doctrine. I am and by the grace of God forever shall remain a living member of His church. I find confidence in the golden chain of salvation as it's called. A chain that cannot be broken. Romans 8, 28 to 30, 29 to 30. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. Glorified, that is, forever remaining a living member of the church. It is, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Go back there too if you have your Bible with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 was our reading as well. Paul is thankful for the church, for the work of the church, for God's grace in building the church. And what does he say at the end in verse 9? God is faithful. God is faithful. Christ bought the church with His own blood. He laid down His life for His sheep. Then He will also keep them safe in His care. There's no need to doubt. For Christ did His work with one future in view, so that you will be guiltless in the day of Christ. That's the day that He will return to judge the living and the dead. By faith we have nothing to fear on that day. For the judge will be the same as the one who already paid for our sins, Lord's Day 19, and we will be declared guiltless. None can bring any accusation against us anymore. Yes, we may hold on to that in faith, 
We must hold on to that in faith. Then I forever remain a living member of the church. And if that's the promise that we have in Christ, if that's what Christ bought us for, then we get to be filled with trust. That's that powerful conclusion to the reading. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. There's an emphasis there. God is faithful, or faithful is God. Faithful is God through whom you were called. What He has begun, He will complete. Working on it constantly as time passes. What He promises, He'll do. We need not doubt. The church may sometimes look like it's a long way off from, match, from behavior matching her status, guiltless in Christ. And me too, in my own sinful self, contributing much to the mess of the church. But God is faithful. He's busy with His church maturing work. The final harvest will be gathered in, and I may confess by the grace of God, I'm going to be there. How encouraging. Paul knew this to be true for the church in Corinth. We know it to be true here. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is faithful. He called us into fellowship with His Son. And all who belong to Him, He will sustain. That's where my confidence comes from to say, I am and forever shall remain a living member of the church. That's my confession in the present. That's my confidence for the future. I am, and forever shall remain a living member of the church. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's pray together that God would apply this word to our hearts. Gracious God in heaven, what a wonder that we may be a part of your Catholic Christian church, your holy Catholic Christian church, that we may confess together that I am and forever shall remain a living member of it. We thank you for opening your word to us this afternoon, enlightening us as to what that confession is. It is our prayer now that you will apply that to our hearts, that every one of us who is gathered here this afternoon may have this impressed upon our hearts, like written on tablets of stone, engraved there never to be removed, that we may confess that with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. And Father, if there is no love present, no love, evidence of life, giving evidence of life, work change in our hearts, that with broken and contrite hearts we would repent of the error of our ways, we would remove the hatred and the anger and the bitterness and the desire of revenge and we would be filled with love. A love which comes about by your spirit and word. A love which reflects the love of Christ, our Savior. In His name we pray, Amen. Let's sing our Amen to that, hymn 61, standing for those who are able.
as grain once scattered on the hillsides was in the broken bread made one. So from all lands your church be gathered into your kingdom by your Son. This is the Holy Catholic Christian Church. We may now have the opportunity to confess together our Holy Catholic Christian faith. Let everyone say together with me, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. The sacrament of holy baptism has been requested by Calvin and Naomi for their son, Miles. Before we invite them forward to have this baptism administered, we will listen to a summary of what, what God's Word teaches us about this sacrament as we've adopted a form for that purpose in our book of praise, page 597, if you would like to read along in the book of praise. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, The doctrine of holy baptism is summarized as follows. First, we and our children are conceived and born in sin and are therefore by nature children of wrath so that we cannot enter the kingdom of God unless we are born again. This is what the immersion in or sprinkling with water teaches us. It signifies the impurity of our souls so that we may detest ourselves, humble ourselves before God and seek our cleansing and salvation outside of ourselves. Second, baptism signifies and seals to us the washing away of our sins through Jesus Christ. We are therefore baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we are baptized into the name of the Father, God the Father testifies and seals to us that He establishes an eternal covenant of grace with us. He adopts us for His children and heirs and promises to provide us with all good and avert all evil, or turn it to our benefit. When we are baptized into the name of the Son, God the Son promises us that He washes us in His blood from all our sins and unites us with Him in His death and resurrection. Thus, we are freed from our sins and accounted righteous before God. When we are baptized into the name of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit assures us by this sacrament that He will dwell in us and make us living members of Christ imparting to us what we have in Christ, namely the cleansing from our sins and the daily renewal of our lives, till we shall finally be presented without blemish among the assembly of God's elect in life eternal. Third, since every covenant contains two parts, a promise and an obligation, we are through baptism called and obliged by the Lord to a new obedience. We are to cleave to this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to trust Him, and to love Him with our whole heart, soul, and mind, and with all our strength. We must not love the world, but put off our old nature and lead a God-fearing life. And if we sometimes through weakness fall into sins, we must not despair of God's mercy nor continue in sin. For baptism is a seal and trustworthy testimony that we have an eternal covenant with God. Although our children do not understand all this, we may not therefore exclude them from baptism. Just as they share without their knowledge in the condemnation of Adam, so are they without their knowledge received into grace in Christ. For the Lord spoke to Abraham, the father of all believers, and thus also speaks to us and our children, saying, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Peter also testifies to this when he says, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Himself. 
Therefore, in the old dispensation, God commanded that infants be circumcised. This circumcision was a seal of the covenant and of the righteousness of faith. Christ also took them in His arms and blessed them, laying His hands on them. In the new dispensation, baptism has replaced circumcision. Therefore, infants must be baptized as heirs of the kingdom of God and of His covenant. And as they grow up, their parents have the duty to instruct them in these things. In order that we may now administer this holy sacrament of God to His glory for our comfort and to the upbuilding of the congregation, let us call upon His holy name. Almighty, eternal God, in Your righteous judgment, You punished the unbelieving and unrepentant world with the flood, but in Your great mercy saved and protected the believer Noah and his family. You drowned the obstinate Pharaoh and all his host in the Red Sea, but led Your people Israel through the midst of the sea on dry ground, by which baptism was signified. We therefore pray that You, in Your infinite mercy, will graciously look upon this, Your child, and incorporate miles by your Holy Spirit into your Son, Jesus Christ, so that He may be buried with Him by baptism into death and raised with Him to walk in newness of life. We pray that He, following Him day by day, may joyfully bear His cross and cleave to Him in true faith, firm hope, and ardent love. Grant that He, comforted in you, may leave this life which is no more than a constant death and at the last day may appear without terror, before the judgment seat of Christ, your Son. All this we ask through Him, our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit, one only God, lives and reigns forever. Amen. Can I ask you to join me at the font? Beloved in Christ the Lord, you have heard that baptism is an ordinance of the Lord our God to seal to us and our children His covenant. We must therefore use this sacrament for that purpose and not out of custom or superstition. That it may be clear then that you desire baptism for the right purpose, you are to answer sincerely the following questions. First, do you confess that our children, though conceived and born in sin and therefore subject to all sorts of misery, even to condemnation? are sanctified in Christ and thus as members of His church ought to be baptized? Second, do you confess that the doctrine of the Old and New Testament, summarized in the confessions and taught here in this Christian church, is the true and complete doctrine of salvation? Third, do you promise as father and as mother to instruct your child in this doctrine as soon as he is able to understand and to have him instructed therein to the utmost of your power. What is your answer, Brother Decker and Sister Decker? After the administration of holy baptism, let's stand together with them. We'll sing God's praise with the words of Psalm 139 with the stanzas 7 and 8. Miles Robert Henry Decker, I baptize you into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That was my fault. I changed it last minute on the pianist. <laughs> oh Lord, you formed my inward parts.
Let's together also give thanks to God for this in prayer. Almighty, merciful God and Father, we thank and praise you that you have forgiven us and our children all our sins through the blood of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. You received us through your Holy Spirit as members of your only begotten Son and so adopted us to be your children. You sealed and confirmed this to us by holy baptism. We pray through your beloved Son that you will also always govern this child by your Holy Spirit, that Miles may be nurtured in the Christian faith and in godliness, and may grow and increase in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant that he thus may acknowledge your fatherly goodness and mercy, which you have shown to him and to us all. May he live in all righteousness under our only teacher, King and High Priest, Jesus Christ, and valiantly fight against and overcome sin of the devil and his whole dominion. May he forever praise and magnify you and your Son, Jesus Christ, together with the Holy Spirit, the one only true God. Amen. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank the Lord our God for the grace given us by adopting us to be His children and receiving us into His covenant as we just had that confirmed. We acknowledge His love and power by which He instills in His children the desire publicly to profess their faith in Him in the presence of His holy church so that they may receive admission to the Holy Supper. Jackson, I will ask that you come forward and join me here as well. Jackson, since you have now come here to make this profession before God in His holy church and hereby to receive admission to the Holy Supper, we ask you to answer sincerely the following questions. First, do you wholeheartedly believe the doctrine of the Word of God, summarized in the confessions and taught here in this Christian church? Do you promise by the grace of God steadfastly to continue in this doctrine in life and death? rejecting all heresies and errors conflicting with God's Word? Second, do you acknowledge God's covenant promises, which have been signified and sealed to you in your baptism, of which you were just reminded of as well? Do you truly detest and humble yourself before God because of your sins and seek your life outside of yourself in Jesus Christ? Third, do you declare that you love the Lord God? and that it is your heartfelt desire to serve Him according to His Word, to forsake the world, and to crucify your old nature? Fourth, do you firmly resolve to commit your whole life to the Lord's service as a living member of His church? Do you promise to submit willingly to the admonition and discipline of the church if it should happen, and may God graciously prevent it, that you become delinquent either in doctrine or in conduct? Jackson, Derek Bauman, what is your answer? Jackson, these are the words of the Lord. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ will Himself restore, estab- confirm, strengthen and establish you. To Him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Again, I will invite you to stand with us and sing together the words of Psalm 119, stanzas 7 and 8, I believe it is. 6 and 7.
I also lead you in a thanksgiving and congregational prayer. Almighty and gracious God, where do we begin? Where do we begin to express our thankfulness to you? Just that we may be here in prayer before your throne, we confess to be the most important part of our thankfulness. And so we offer this prayer to you also out of thankfulness. You have been so good to us this afternoon as you have been at all times. But there's something special about today when we may witness baptism and profession of faith together. We give you the praise as we acknowledged already in the form for public profession of faith that you who adopt children also bring them to confession. That members of the church profess themselves to be living members of the church. Father, we give you thanks for Jackson and with Jackson. We thank you with his family, with his friends, including and especially Ava. What a moment to witness a young man in a world which is increasingly hostile we might say even especially to young men, to see a young man stand before you and your holy church, acknowledging that he belongs to you and committing his life in service to you. We pray, continue to endow him with your spirit that he may fulfill these vows. Empower him with a spirit of power and of strength that he would never be ashamed of this gospel which he has confessed, for we know it to be the power of yours into salvation for everyone who believes. It is our prayer that many more would come to make this good confession in the presence of witnesses. We pray then for the youth in our church as well, those who have not yet made a public profession of faith, some who are right there and yet not there, who do not quite experience that certainty. Father, give that to them. That they may recognize that this is not something to be put off indefinitely. That you are waiting for their I do. Waiting for them to acknowledge the promises that you have made to them. To take ownership of them. We pray for our boys and girls as they receive instruction, as Their parents have committed, we heard Calvin and Naomi make that commitment about Miles as well, to instruct him in this doctrine as soon as he is able to understand and to have him instructed. Be with our boys and girls that as they learn all these things that they will take that to heart, not as just things for their head to pack full of information, but that it would change their hearts. Father, we pray for parents that they may have what it, they need to, to do what your word commands them to, to nurture their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We pray for those who join parents in that task of instruction, and we think also of our school. They're entering into the last week before the summer break. We praise you for bringing them through this year and allowing us to have what has largely been an an uninterrupted year, something that was unknown to us for a couple of years. We pray for the teachers as they maintain some focus yet for the children, with the students as they finish off the material that needs to be learned yet, and as they have all these exciting things planned for this week with field trips, and we think also of the Ottawa trip, a group of boys and girls together with chaperones who are hitting the road early tomorrow morning to go to Ottawa and to spend some time together visiting our capital city and learning more about what goes on there in Parliament and, and not to learn only that way, but to learn what it is to fellowship together as boys and girls of the covenant. Be with the chaperones as they give leadership 
But they may also set godly examples for our boys and our girls. And Father, we pray for the Guido exams that are going to be written this week. They are wrapping up a year as well with these final exams. And will you help them to recall all the things that they have been studying so that when they write the answers down, it will be an accurate reflection of, of what they have learned as they apply themselves there too with the talents and the gifts you have given. We pray for our seniors. We thank you for the example that they have been able to serve as for the generations. We have at least four generations here with the birth of Milo, Miles. It's your faithfulness that leads us through the generations and we're grateful for our seniors. We pray for them as they get older and weaker and frailer. Comes with all kinds of aches and pains and concerns about their bodies their bones, their organs, their flesh, whatever the case may be. It's a tent that's breaking. And they're longing for a heavenly home. We pray for their caregivers, families, PSWs, doctors, nurses. That can be an exhausting work as well to provide that constant care. Will you give extra stamina and perseverance for that? We pray for those who provide care and for mental health care. Think of counselors and psychiatrists and psychologists as need be. And sometimes it's necessary to go to programs to step out of the daily routines of life and, and go away for a while and sit under that kind of care. We're grateful to you for such caregivers, knowing that in the end we still need to turn to you as the good physician who alone can give healing bodily, physically, emotionally, mentally. We pray for the latest addition to the congregation. We have witnessed the baptism of Miles, but there's one even younger, little Oakland, Lawrence Kingma. Another good gift to Ryan and Kristen. Another son to add to the quiver, which is so wonderfully full of them. We provide for them as they transition to another responsibility. As we pray all these things and we lay them before your throne, we're reminded again of how diverse a congregation is and, and how many different needs this Catholic Christian church has. But you have set them apart as a holy people. And we may trust that you who call us will also care for us. It's beyond our comprehension that we can pour out all these needs before you. And it becomes overwhelming sometimes to us and our prayer lists just grow and grow and grow and yet you know them all. You know every need. You know every name. What an awesome God you are who made Himself known to us in His Son. And it's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. You have an opportunity to express thankfulness to our God in the offering. The offering this afternoon is for the work of mercy. After we'll sing a doxology, the words of hymn 7, stanza 3.
Lift up your hearts to the Lord to receive his blessing and go your ways in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. May I ask you to sit for a few moments as I make a presentation to Jackson. Jackson, I'm tempted to say, enough said, but that would not be very uh, appropriate, I think. You need to have a little bit more of the spotlight and keep you standing here uncomfortably. (laughs) I just want to reread something you already read, was on the screen, but if, if you're anything like me, then... Sometimes when we sing, we're not always paying attention. I'm not going to suggest that's what you were doing by reading this again, but Peter also says it never hurts to remind somebody. This is what you sang when you were standing here with me. In your commandments, I take great delight. I turn to them in thoughtful meditation. The path marked by your law, I keep in sight to guard myself against all deviation. Your statutes, I will not neglect or slight, Your word I praise with joy and exaltation. Do good to me so that my life may be devoted to your words in all their splendor. Open my eyes that I may clearly see your perfect law and gaze upon its wonders. Do not, O Lord, hide your commands from me who here on earth but as a pilgrim wander. I already asked you a question, so I'm not going to ask you again, but it says I. This was something we all took on our lips, and I trust that it was also something you took to heart. I, you are a pilgrim, and you are still wandering together with the rest of us, but take these words to heart. And Kedisri wants to help you in that by presenting you with a book that you would meditate on the Word of God. Uh, You're probably familiar with this book, certainly with the one who designed the cover of this book. And it's our prayer that, uh, as beautiful as the book is, that when we see it in a number of years, it would look more beautiful because it's worn and torn and tattered. You've poured your heart heart out over it. Calvin says that the Psalms, they're an anatomy of the soul. Everything that lives in our soul is recorded in the Psalms. And that means there may be times when tears flow on these pages and that's okay. Blood may flow on these pages, but that's okay. Perhaps in 10 years, the Lord willing, I'll be able to see if that's true for you. It's our prayer as counsel that you will use this book for your growth as you wander as a pilgrim. For the rest of you, uh, I will congratulate you, yes. Um, But please join him and the rest of the family. They're going to come out with us and they will be outside and then take an opportunity to share in their joy on this day. Congratulations. Just let me grab my stuff.